Welcome everyone. My name is Cindy Black. I'm the executive director of Fix Democracy First. And tonight we're here welcoming back Kristen Eberhard for Becoming a Democracy Round Two. And we are very happy to welcome back tonight's guest, Kristen Eberhard. As many of you already know, Kristen is the author of the new book, Becoming a Democracy, How We Can Fix the Electoral College, Gerrymandering and Our Elections. Um, we weren't able to get all the reforms covered she wrote about in her book at her last program in December, so we asked her back to cover some of those topics. Um, Kristen is the Director of Climate and Democracy at Sightline Institute and a proud policy wonk and a member of Sightline's management team. She researches, writes about, and speaks about climate policy change and democracy reform. She is known as a leading expert on electoral form, reform in the Pacific Northwest and is considered an authority on proportional representation as well as carbon pricing. Before joining Sightline, Kristen worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council, leading its California climate work in San Francisco, then moving to its Southern California office to help the largest municipality owned utility in the country get off coal and onto energy efficiency and renewables. She also taught courses on climate change and energy law at Stanford Law School and UCLA Law School of Law. Uh, Kristen graduated with honors from Stanford University, cum laude from Duke University of Law and earned a master's of environmental management from Duke, Duke's Nicholas School of Environment. She lives and works in Portland with her husbands and sons. So welcome so much. Um, we're so happy to have you here. Kristen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much for um, having me again. Okay, so as most of you know, my book looks at 10 proven solutions, no constitutional amendment needed, no change in the courts needed, and most can and are being implemented at the state level. So last time we talked a lot about state level solutions and progress, but today we're going to talk about the federal level. Um, so particularly about HR1, which would protect voting rights across the country, it would stop the worst gerrymandering from happening. Um, lots of great stuff in HR1 and also in um, HR4, which I'll talk about a little bit. But unfortunately, the reality is we will not be able to pass that until we get rid of the filibuster. Um, so it's kind of the filibuster or HR1. Um, so we'll talk about that and then about how ranked choice voting could possibly change partisan dynamics in Congress and then how proportional representation would change everything. Um, okay, so this past year, we had this record turnout. It's actually uh, 150 million Americans voted, including 100 million who voted earlier by mail, which was great, but it created this backlash of state bills wanting to roll back how easy it is to vote. So we've got more than 100 bills have already been introduced in states across the country um, aiming to restrict that sort of turnout, that record turnout that we saw this year. Um, so we can kind of categorize these in, into um, bills that make it harder to register to vote. So they uh, eliminate same day registration or eliminate automatic voter registration. Bills that make it harder to stay registered. So you've finally gotten yourself onto the rolls and then you show up to vote and you find out that you're not on the rolls anymore because there was a, an aggressive voter purge that took um, eligible voters off the rolls. And then there's the bills that make it harder to vote. So now you're, you're on the rolls, you stayed on the rolls, um, but you show up and you don't have the right kind of ID or you want to vote by mail and you can't for some reason. So um, a lot of the bills are related to making it harder to vote in those ways. So the good news is, you know, those are all state bills. And um, HR1, the For the People Act, is a federal bill that would essentially just stop all of that. It would, it would set some sort of federal standards for how easy it is to register, stay registered, and vote. And states would not be able to go below that floor. They wouldn't be able to treat voters worse than this sort of uh, federally mandated minimum. Um, so there's actually a lot of great stuff in HR1. I'm just going to hit on um, a few things because uh, these are solutions that are in the book. So um, 
it would have every state do automatic voter registration, where if you have proved your citizenship at a um, state agency like the DMV, you automatically get added to the rolls unless you opt out. It would make it easier to stay registered. So ERIC is the Electronic Registration Information Center. It's a, um, a, a non profit nonpartisan group that states can join to help them keep their voter rolls clean. And it uses the best available data and technology to make sure that it's identifying voters who have actually died or actually moved so that states can take those off of their rolls. And it's um, better than what a lot of states do where they just say, hey, if you skipped a few elections, we're going to take you off the rolls. Um, lots of people skip elections. It doesn't mean they have moved or died. Um, but we do know if they've moved or died, we have that information and Eric provides it to states. And then finally, they make it that HR1 makes it easier to vote. So it sets some minimum standards for voting by mail, says everybody should have access, there should be a cure process. It just sort of sets out um, what many states are already doing, but just requires every state to do it. And it restores voting rights for people who have been convicted of a felony, but then served their sentence, which there are right now many states that um, do not restore your right to vote even after you have done your time. Um, so those are all the ones relating to voting, but there's a lot more in HR1, and I'll just mention it also has independent redistricting, which is very important. Um, it has campaign finance. Um, uh, it, it has a pilot for vouchers, which the city of Seattle has been successfully using vouchers, so this would uh, pilot that at the national level. And then it has other uh, election security things like risk limiting audits that many states already do, but it would provide some funding to make sure that more states do it. Um, and then, so that's all HR1, but there is also the John Lewis Voting Rights Act as sort of a um, a complementary bill. And what it does is very important. Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 said that states that had a history of discrimination, of, of making it harder for people of color to vote, couldn't make changes to their voting laws without pre-clearance from the federal government. Basically, it said, we've noticed that when you make changes to your voting laws, it tends to be in order to disenfranchise people of color. So before you do that, just check with the federal government first. And if it's a you know neutral or, or fine change, we'll let it through. And if it is aimed at um, restricting voting rights for people of color, we will stop you. In 2013, the Supreme Court struck down that part of the Voting Rights Act and um, said, well, you know, we don't know if these states are still doing racist things, so Congress needs to come up with a new formula for deciding who needs preclearance. And of course, Congress was not able to pass that new formula through the Senate. The Senate blocked it. And um, so for coming up on a decade, states have been free to make changes that disadvantage people of color, that stop people from being able to vote, because there's no preclearance requirement. So the John Lewis Voting Rights Act just recreates that. It, it creates a new standard for how you tell if a state needs preclearance. It passed the House last year, um, but if it made it through the Senate, then we would sort of fix that glaring problem that we have right now that states can pass these voter restrictions without any kind of federal check. Um, so HR1 and HR4 both passed the House in 2019 and, of course, did not pass the Senate. Uh, HR1 is uh, set to be voted on in the House again in early March. It's very likely it will pass and then it will go to the Senate where, if nothing changes, it will die. Um, and oh, so here is a, a the automatic voter registration and that uh, electronic database are two things that states are already doing. So all the dark green states in this map already are doing both of those things. So it is sort of spreading slowly through the states. But what HR1 would do is go bam, <laughs> turn the whole map green in one fell swoop, every state would have to do it. And we wouldn't be sort of fighting this state by state battle to get basic best practices. Um, okay, and then this is the list of states um, where the party 
controls redistricting and where there's uh, one party has complete control. So basically that that party will be able to control the redistricting process. Um, and of course, once the census is done, all states will be going through a redistricting process, which will then determine what their congressional districts look like for the next 10 years. And what we saw in 2010 was that uh, Republicans got control of a lot of these states and then drew the lines and gerrymandered them so that those states' votes did not match up with um, their actual representation for the past decade. So this is, uh, we're, we're now coming up on the redistricting and the chance to fix that. And unfortunately, we are in a position to see it get worse as um, most of the places with partisan redistricting are in GOP controlled hands. And the, the states that are not on the li this list are ones that have um, independent or bipartisan redistricting. So it should be a, a fairer process already. Um, so again, all of these states without HR1 they will be gerrymandering their lines so that districts uh, who the, the district lines pick the winner uh, more than the voter does. But if we were to pass HR1, it would require independent redistricting. So all of these places would have to move immediately from this partisan redistricting process to an independent process, which would result in fairer results for those voters for the next decade. Okay, so HR1, really important stuff, really fundamental to who gets to vote and whether their vote matters. And it's likely to pass the House and then go to the Senate. So what will happen in the Senate? So the Senate, as we probably all know, it represents states, not people. And that was a compromise at the, the beginning of this country. And many of the founding fathers, including Madison and Hamilton, hated it. They thought that was unfair that the government should represent people, not state boundaries. Um, but they kind of had to swallow it in order to get the Constitution passed and keep the country together. And they really kind of thought it was a temporary compromise. Um, some of their writings from the time suggest that they thought you know, some people aren't going to put up with this for very long. They're not going to let this happen. Um, and at the time, it wasn't so bad. The biggest colony was 13 times the smallest one. And now the biggest state is 70 times the smallest state. So they thought it was bad at the time, and it has only gotten worse. So depending on where you live, you, you just have very different representation in the Senate. Um, and the bigger states are the ones that are growing tend to be more diverse. They're, they're growing because they're gaining more people, whereas the ones that are staying small tend to be whiter and more rural. So the, the bias is not just random, it's actually a bias towards white rural people against more diverse and metropolitan populations. Um, so the Senate itself is just very skewed, but then you add on top of that the filibuster which says essentially that to pass any kind of controversial bill, you essentially need 60 votes. And now, so you take those two things and put them together that some senators represent a lot of people and some represent very few, and 40 senators, 41 senators can block um, any piece of legislation they want to. And what you come up with is that t senators representing 20% of Americans can block things that a majority of Americans and a majority of senators would like to pass, um, which is kind of stunning <laughs> for a country that um, believes itself to be a democracy. Okay, so the filibuster, uh, the filibuster is not in the Constitution. <laughs> it was not in the original Senate. It's, it's just a rule that senators um, made up and a rule that was not used very much until very recently. So it's not like it has um, really this great weight of tradition behind it. Um, but there are two Democratic senators who have said they, they do not want any rollback of the, of, um, of the filibuster. And really, when you look at this, that uh, with 
without passing HR1, there are these states that could roll back voting rights, and there are a lot of states that will definitely gerrymander their lines for the next 10 years. Um, you have to ask yourself, what is more important, keeping the filibuster, which is just this rule that senators made up, or you know, having our democracy work? Um, so some of the objections that I hear about getting rid of the filibuster are that the filibuster forces bipartisanship. And that is, it's just not true. Um, and we can see it's not true in practice. Uh, it's not as if, you know, the, the huge increase in the use of filibuster has not read, led to more bipartisan bills. It's just led to more blocked bills. And you just have to look at the incentives to figure out why this is true. So the minority party really has no incentive to help the majority party get things passed. Their best, you know, political move is to use the filibuster to block everything and then the majority party looks ineffective, can't deliver on any of their promises that they made to their voters. And so then the minority party can go back to the voters and say, hey, they didn't get anything done, put us in charge and we'll get something done. Um, so for bipartisanship to happen, it's really the minority party that needs to be convinced to come to the table. And the thing that convinces them to come to the table is that feeling that, you know, if you're not at the table, <laughs> you're on the menu, right? So if the majority party has this credible threat that we will pass it, we will pass some version of HR1 with or without you, then the minority party is then incentivized to at least try and shape that. Like it's going to get done no matter what. The, the majority party is going to be able to tell their voters, we passed things, we delivered on our promises. You're not going to be able to make them look bad. So the best you can do is come and shape it and then be able to say to your voters, look, we're in the minority, but we got some some compromises. We got some stuff into that bill um, that we wouldn't have gotten if we had not been at the table. Um, so another fear that I hear is that uh, that if we can pass things by majority vote, it'll lead to like really extreme or crazy things happening. And by having to have a 60% vote, it moderates what gets passed. Um, but the truth is, well, the 60% requirement just means nothing gets passed. And, you know, even though the, the Democrats uh, have, you know, control of the Senate, there's plenty of moderate and blue dog Democrats who are not going to sign on to really radical bills. So it's not that we really need to fear that something crazy is going to get passed. We already have a moderating force just within the party. We just need something to get passed. Um, so, so another thing that I hear about the filibuster is, okay, well, you know, maybe maybe we want it right now, but we, uh, or, you know, maybe we want to get rid of it right now, but we might want it in the future. You know, there might be some bad bills in the future that we're going to want to block, and then we'll be sorry that we got rid of the filibuster. And to that, I say, Neil Gorsuch. <laughs> um, the Republicans, when they, the, when the filibuster was going to block them from nominating uh, or from confirming a Supreme Court justice who they wanted, they got rid of it. And so if that if it ever comes in the future that there is a thing that the Republicans want to do and they have a majority and and the Democrats try and block them using the filibuster, they will get rid of it. So um, we might as well get rid of it now and be able to actually pass things and have our legislative branch function again rather than say, oh, we're going to hamstring our legislative branch for X number more years in the futile hope that it'll be good for us at some point in the future. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ranked choice voting. Um, so for, for many elections in the United States, there's a party primary that selects one candidate from each of the major parties. And because only the most partisan voters vote in a primary, they often select a more extreme candidate from that party. And then the two more extreme candidates go to the general election and compete. And the voters in the general election maybe don't see anything they love, but they have to pick one um, of those two because third parties can't uh, usually cannot win in our system. Um, so ranked choice voting is a way of 
kind of mitigating this problem. So you let voters rank their candidates in order of preference, which means that the election can handle more than two candidates without falling prey to vote splitting. And that creates the possibility, um, for example, that you could have no primary and just have you know, everybody running so that the candidate, the voters on the general ballot would see both those extreme candidates and the moderate candidates and the third party candidates and would be able to rank them all. Um, or you could have a top four or a top five primary where the, you know, the strongest four or five candidates make it to the general and then the voters rank them. Um, Rachel's voting has other benefits like it tamps down negative campaigning and it's used across the country. Lots of places are using ranked choice voting for some kind of election. So this year, or you know, in, in 2020, Alaskans voted to use a top four primary and a ranked choice general election for their governor, state legislators, uh, US Congress members, and president. And Alaska is the second state um, after Maine to adopt ranked choice voting for state and federal elections. And you know, this maybe uh, is really making a difference. So Many Republicans, what we're seeing right now is that many elected Republicans are really afraid of getting primaried by a, a even bigger MAGA or Trump supporter. And so they are sort of um, tamping down, you know, not voting for impeachment, not, not uh, talking about Trump inciting violence in the Capitol because they're sort of afraid of that Republican base, of that closed Republican primary where only the most partisan voters are voting because if they lose in that, they'll never make it to the general election where maybe the broader electorate would choose them. So uh, they are moving to the right in response to those primary voters, not to the bigger selection of general election voters. So Lisa Murkowski from Alaska uh, that is no longer the dynamic for her. She will be in a top four open primary, which she will certainly be one of the top four candidates in Alaska. And then she'll face general election voters. And so that will be all Alaskans will be um, voting on her, not just this subset of Republican primary voters. And that has given her um, perhaps uh, more confidence to be able to take stands that she thinks are good for and will be popular with all voters rather than having to cater to just the primary voters. Um, so ranked choice voting uh, is gaining momentum at not at one not just in Alaska but in a bunch of cities um, across the country this uh, election and I want to particularly point out um, Albany California where a multi-winner ranked choice voting won 72 percent so just a huge landslide win in Albany and that is what brings us to proportional representation. So ranked choice voting is kind of an umbrella term that just refers to that ranked ballot where you get to rank your candidates. Um, but there are actually uh, kind of two really different ways that that ranked ballot can play out. That ranked ballot can select a single winner as in Maine and Alaska, or it can select multiple winners at once, which is what the city of Albany is going to do and what the city of Cambridge has done for, for many, many decades. Um, and where the single winner form has some benefits, like we saw, it, it maybe kind of can tamp down some of that extreme partisanship that we're seeing. The multi-winner form is really transformative. Um, so, you know, just going back to the founders again, it's interesting, some of the things that they were very prescient about, but, you know, didn't necessarily know how to plan for. So uh, George Washington was, um, very worried about two party rule and about this sort of back and forth and, and trying to dominate the other and, and fighting against each other instead of for the common good. Um, and he and um, some of the other founders really wanted some form of proportional representation. It's just that they didn't know how to get it at the time. Democracy was, uh, you know, representative democracy was pretty young and they, they're, they're just these methods of voting to get a proportional result had not been developed and tested or else I'm, I'm sure many of these founders would have been in favor of them. But uh, now in the, the 
the 20th century, most democracies adopted some form of proportional representation. And um, one of the things we see is that proportional representation ends up with a higher voter turnout than winner take all systems. And it also ends up with greater trust in the system. So uh, if you ask voters who's, you know, whose favorite party or candidate lost, if after the election you ask them, like, how do they feel about the election? Um, voters in proportional countries say, I feel fine. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sad that my guy lost, but I still believe in democracy. And voters in winner take all countries like the United States, um, when their par party or candidate loses, they often lose faith in the whole system. They think something was wrong. They think maybe they're, that, that, you know, that something's broken, that there's some kind of cheating or fraud. And that should sound very familiar right now because there are a lot of Americans who are convinced that there was something fraudulent with this election. And um, some of the reason that uh, they have been able to be convinced of that is because of the system we use, which actually kind of creates some of that distrust compared to other um, more modern systems. So the other big problem with our single winner systems is it, this is what lets gerrymandering happen. The reason gerrymandering is possible is because we use single winner districts. So this is the original gerrymander <laughs> um, in Massachusetts. Um, th that was how they drew the districts and you know, some artists thought it looked like a big salamander. And um, the only real, so in, the independent dis redistricting from HR1 will definitely make gerrymandering a little harder. It will, it will take away the, the most partisan gerrymandering, but it will not completely solve the problem that districts can pick winners. And to solve that, you need some form of proportional representation, which makes it basically impossible um, to gerrymander. And proportional representation is, uh, it, there's many ways of getting there, but the, the idea is that if a particular party wins 20% of the votes, they get 20% of the seats. If they win 40% of the votes, we get 40% of the seats. Um, and it usually ends up with more than two parties. And depending on the design, you might end up with sort of two major parties and two more minor parties. You know, some systems are much more fractured than that, um, but often that's what you get is sort of two, two big tent or like centrist parties and then a couple of um, smaller parties. And if you look at the way that American voters think, so this is using um, um, survey data from the Pew Research Center um, and splitting voters up along two axes. So traditional cultural values versus changing cultural values. So this is sort of their views on abortion and same-sex marriage and um, um, racial and ethnic diversity. And then on the other axis, you look at pro-business versus regulate uh, corporations. So this is looking at, you know, how much do people think that corporations should be, should be taxed or, or regulated or um, that money should be more evenly distributed versus not. And um, yeah, you know, they kind of go along this axis, but you can see there's room for more than two parties here. And if we had more than two parties, there could be these interesting ways in which, you know, uh, a more culturally conservative party might have more um, views on regulating corporations. So like a populist party might join with, you know, an AOC type party to actually do some regulations on businesses. Whereas right now, because the, these two parties have these strong identities, it's very hard to work across parties in that way. Um, so, as I said, there's different ways of getting there. So one way of getting there is using a ranked choice ballot, like the one that you saw, but having multiple winners from that ranked choice. Another way is a mixed member proportional, where you get two votes, one for your favorite individual candidate and one for your favorite party. And this method has a lot of promise because New Zealand, which used to vote the way that the United States votes, um, it's really only 
the UK and her former colonies who vote the way we did. So New Zealand being a former colony used to vote the way we do. And in the 90s, they were like, this is messed up. We get, we're getting really bad results. Let's, let's rethink this. And they moved to this form of um, mixed member proportional. And the result was this. So, so prior to this voting reform, they looked just like the United States. They basically just, they had, you know, red and blue. And um, afterward, they look like this. You still have two of the bigger parties, but you you have some other um, other parties mixed in there. And interestingly, it has this huge effect on uh, Maori representation. Maori are the native people of New Zealand, and they had um, previously been had a couple of seats that were just guaranteed to them and they would only get those seats and nothing else once mixed member proportional went into place they started winning more seats more in proportion to their uh population and women started win winning a lot more seats um and more uh more cabinet seats as well they, they once they were elevated to positions of uh, leadership they uh launched from there um into other positions of leadership and um, so this is just one other way of getting there. Like I said, there's multiple. This is open lists. So the attraction of this one is it's a, a pretty simple ballot like we have now. It's just to pick one. You get to pick your favorite candidate. You know, there's a whole list of candidates. You pick your favorite one. So in that sense, it's very much like now. But it's different in that those that more than one candidate per party can run. So then you can pick your favorite from the party. And um, the party will still get a fair share of the seats. So, you know, if 30% of people vote for Republicans, 40% for Democrats, then um, Republicans get 30% of the seats and Democrats 40%. Um, so in conclusion, there's so much we need to do right now, responding to a global pandemic, fighting climate change, writing equality, and we have this huge opportunity to pass um, voter protections and protections against gerrymandering through Congress. But we uh, we might get blocked by, you know, it's, it's ironic, right? Like when you have rules about democracy that uh, disempower some voters, then it's hard to pass the bills that were, will empower them. When you have, you know, for example, senators representing 20% of the population who can block legislation. Um, but I am hopeful that we might be able to do it and that that will be this big leap forward for democratic protections in our country. And um, the book, you can get it from Amazon or Book Baby. And we do have an audio book coming soon. It's all recorded and ready and it's just held up um, with Amazon. But um, it, if you, I, I'll, I'll tell Cindy and she can send it to the list when it is um, available. And I look forward to, to talking more with you about uh, all of these topics. Great, thank you so much. We have quite a few questions, so I'm gonna jump right in. And I'm gonna start with the first question I have, because you were talking about HR1. The gerrymandering piece in there about independent redistricting forms, if it does end up passing this year, were those reforms likely not go into effect until 2031? Yeah, so the, the the way it's written right now, they wouldn't go in effect until 2031. There is a some uh, work behind the scenes right now to change that so that they would go into effect right away, or at least that there's a backstop. So um, there's some um, requirements around, like even if we don't get the independent redistricting commissions, some standards that any redistrictors have to meet so that it gives more of a chance for if there is a horrible gerrymander, there's now kind of a federal law by which to challenge um, that gerrymandering. Great. And just for people that don't know, in Washington, we have a bipartisan redistricting commission made up of two Republicans, two Democrats, and a non-voting chair. Um, we're going to get into some questions here from the audience. Donna asks, HB 2366, which is an Oregon bill to allow those incarcerated to vote. Can you comment on that one? Yeah, that is um, a great bill. I mentioned in um, HR1 that it would require voting rights for anybody who has served their sentence. Washington is one of the states that restores rights, um, not when you 
uh, re rejoin the community, but after you have served all parole and um, um, and probation. And so the, the Washington bill would say, look, as soon as you're rejoining the community, you're a member of the community, you should have the right to vote. And I do want to mention that's House Bill 1078 in Washington, and it just got voted out of rules and it'll be going to the floor for a vote very soon. So we'll keep people on that one. Um, why is Wisconsin not on the list? Because they have, um, I believe it's because Wisconsin has a split that they have a, um, the, the governor's from one party and the legislature's from the other, and the governor has to be involved in the redistricting. So there's some check on it but you know that that list that i had that's from the brennan center and those are just the worst right you know the the states that are not on that that doesn't mean they they can't gerrymander it just means that there's they don't have a complete partisan lock on the whole process and then what was the second what is the exact definition of a filibuster yeah, the fil well, exact definition. The like original filibuster word comes from something about pirates. Yeah, um, it's a Dutch <laughs> word meaning pirate. Actually, it's a, yeah, I read that. Um, but in this case, the one the thing that I'm talking about is um, that. Uh, essentially you can hold up a bill and it used to be that you had to talk right that you that as long as you were talking um they couldn't close for the vote it's now you don't even have to talk you can just um invoke um that we we don't want to close debate and then you just sit there and wait and um to close debate you have to have a vote uh called a cloture vote which basically says no we're going to move on you know we're going to stop debate and move on and it's that cloture vote which requires 60 senators to say yes to cloture. And so that is the, the technical process by which um, 41 senators can hold things up because as long as they refuse to vote yes on cloture, the bill can't move. I did have a follow-up question to that. How were the Republicans able to get rid of that if they didn't have 60 votes? Yeah, it's this, <laughs> it's this, obscure parliamentary move, which I, I don't know if I can get all the steps right, but it's basically um, the parliamentarian puts forth a, a, a proposal and then, um, then that proposal is not subject to filibuster. And so, as so it, it so it doesn't get held up by filibuster. They, they propose a change to the rules, and uh, a majority of senators can approve that change to the rules. So that's how um, Mr. Gorsuch. Are the Democrats able to do something similar to get like HR one passed? Absolutely. And and the fil you know and the interesting thing about the filibuster is you know I sort of talk about just like bust the filibuster like it's one thing, but you know you can there's different levels that you could do, right? So um, what the Republicans did is they just got rid of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations, you know, so that was kind of a singular thing. Democrats, if they don't, you know, if they feel like it's going too far to completely get rid of the filibuster, they could get rid of the filibuster for election reform bills and just get HR1 through um, and, and not have it be this huge blanket um, you know, if they felt like that's just going too far, they can do it surgically. I, I do want to mention that just as today, all the Democrats have uh, co-sponsored that bill in the House, which is pretty big. Let's move on to Susan's question. I've heard a little bit about approval voting. What are your thoughts on approval voting versus ranked choice voting? Yeah, so approval voting is where it, everyone can vote for as many as they want. So you can fill in as many bubbles as you want, and then you just add up all the bubbles and the um, the person with the most votes wins. So if we go back to the sort of classic spoiler election of Bush versus Gore versus Nader, the idea would be that people who liked both Nader and Gore could have filled in both bubbles. And if all of the Nader voters had filled in the Gore bubbles too, that Gore would have um, won. Um, so that's, uh, it's it's a great, it's a very like easy, simple system, you know, not a big change. You don't have to have a big change in machinery. So there's a lot of benefits, but what we've seen in the real world is that um, 
often people just end up voting for one anyway, because they see that if if, for example, there was, a, you know, a, a Bush and Perot versus Gore and Nader, and you approved all the ones that you wanted, and the Bush voters only approved Bush, um, then, then he would end up winning. So it, it ends up that once people get used to the system, it usually breaks down and becomes just like the, the one that we use now. Um, whereas with ranked choice voting, um, you can safely rank more choices without being worried that it's going to hurt your first choice. And so what we see with the experience in cities is that people consistently will rank more than one choice, which makes the, the whole system work when people are ranking more than one. And I also um, think that isn't it approval voting doesn't work as well in a proportional representation? Yeah. Process? Yeah. And then that goes back to, you know, the single winner versus multi winner. So single winner ranked choice voting, it's, it's nice. It has some benefits. Um, and if you're going to do a single winner system, I, I think ranked choice voting has some benefits over approval. Um, but in that multi winner system, approval voting doesn't work in a multi winner situation, whereas a ranked ballot does work for proportional representation, which is where you sort of get that um, much bigger change of, of very fair results. Um, next question from Michael is, why do you think voter turnout is so low in France, besides no ranked choice voting? Um, yeah, France also, France has a mixed uh, system. So they, uh, they have a, you know, a, they have, I think, like one of their houses in proportional and the other is uh, winner take all. Um, but other than that, I don't know that much about France's uh, system other than that it's not as proportional as some of the other European countries. Yeah, I was just surprised to see their voter turnout less than ours. Um, next question from someone is, as presented, could ranked choice voting eventually um, open a space that could lead to creating more than two parties? So it depends on if you're talking about single winner ranked choice voting or multi winner. So single winner, it might open up an opportunity for some other parties to run, but it pro it probably does not create a multi winner system. Whereas uh, multi winner ranked choice voting would create a multi party system. Next question from Donna is, can you vote for more than one in open list voting? You might need to explain what that means. Um, open list voting is where, you know, you list the candidates by party and then you get to pick one. Um, usually that is just a pick one system, but I believe there are some places where you can pick more than one. Um, but the most common form of it is just pick one. And Terry asks, like the theory of proportional, she, I guess, like the theory of proportional representation, but in current scenario, couldn't we end up with good space guy or more seriously QAnon follower, followers or proud boy leaders? Yeah, so in the current situation, you probably don't end up with good space guy, <laughs> but Yes, we could end up with some QAnon or Proud Boys, um, but the benefit is that let's say Proud Boys have 5% of the vote, or let's say QAnon has 10% of the vote. Um, so depending on how, how, um, how many winners you have in your system, if your threshold is 15%, then they only get 10% of support, they're not going to get in. If your threshold is 10% and they have 10% support, they'll get 10% of the seats, but they cannot do anything with that amount. They cannot hijack the government. They can't take over the legislative agenda. They cannot pass any bills, um, which compared to our current situation where arguably one party is, is semi-captured by QAnon and they do have the power to pass bills. They do have the power to set the legislative agenda, um, relegating QAnon to their actual support in the population, which let's just hypothetically say is 10%, um, would be a much safer system than what we have now where they're able to actually punch above their weight. 
Next question from Lee. What about using the East Point, Michigan two winner RCV method to assure that most, if not all states have bipartisan representation in the US Senate? Congress could enact a new rotation schedule with states electing two senators rather than one at each two year cycle. A minority of voters in any state, one third plus one vote could then elect a US Senator. Yeah, so definitely the East Point system is, um, it's a proportional system, but just with two winners. Um, to get to a really multi-party system, you have to have three winners or more to, to have those third parties have a chance of getting in. So I support the East Point system um, and just would say, I, you know, like to take it one step further and have three. As far as senators go, um, unfortunately, to change the schedule of senators, you need to change the Constitution. Um, so that is, it, it's just, it's a really big lift to change. The, the US Constitution is the hardest constitution in the world to change. So that's why I've been focusing um, in the book on things that don't require a constitutional amendment because it's just such a big lift. And oftentimes reforms have to begin in the states and if there's enough states that actually push reforms and sometimes that's enough to get national legislation but it seems like we haven't had a, con a constitutional amendment in quite a while and some people say we're probably overdue for one especially something to correct like Citizens United decision and things for like sure. that. Yeah, but yeah, if, if the East Point, you know, if we see more, and Albany is now using multi-winner ranked choice voting, if we see more cities and states using that, that's what then builds the momentum for people to be clamoring for that kind of constitutional amendment that we don't, we don't have that movement yet. I do want to give a shout out for the state bill here in Washington State, the local options bill, HB 1156, just passed out of House Appropriations today, 22 to 11, and it's been getting bipartisan support. So it's on its way to the Rules Committee. Um, next question from Rebecca is, how can we change the narrative in the national media that suggests gerrymandering is inevitable in states with a partisan lock on the process? Even in states with independent commissions, such as Colorado, which includes Republicans, Democrats, and independents, it will be essential for people to be involved in the process to ensure that voices are heard and their communities are not cracked or packed. There are, for fantastic, there are fantastic resources available for everyone to draw their communities to, uh, and to create electoral district maps of their states that are not open source in 2011. Like, I'm thinking of like Dave's redistricting app is one of them. We're going to be doing a training on that in March. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, depending on what state you're in and what their process is, um, you know, there's groups uh, like Fixed Democracy First or like Indivisible that can um, connect you with how to make comments on that process and, and try and influence it so that it's not um, as blatant as it might otherwise be. Yeah, we're working with the League of Women Voters of Washington for their Speak Up Schools. That's a series we're going to be doing, a, a four-part series in March. And if you're on our mailing list, you'll be getting um, information about that. But we're going to be covering redistricting 101, how to test. Uh, the second training is going to be on how to testify before the commission. The third is going to be looking at data lenses and um, uh demographics in the third and the fourth one is with Dave Bradley, the creator of Dave's redistricting app where you can actually get in there and learn how to draw maps, which is pretty nerdy thing to do, but a lot of people like to do it. Um, Glenda asks, why, why do you think Jane uh, Manchin is against ending the filibuster? I ask myself this a lot. Um, so, you know, he, he's from a fairly conservative state. And um, uh, like my best guess is that he feels like as long as there's the filibuster, he won't have to take a vote on bills that maybe his more conservative constituents wouldn't like, but that the Democratic Party is going to pressure him to say yes on. So it kind of just keeps him out of that fight because they just won't ever come to a vote. He won't he won't have to make that decision. And that he's afraid that if um, 
without the filibuster, those bills will come to a vote and the Democrats will be depending on him because they need every single vote to pass something and then he'll be in this bind between do I vote for this bill that my constituents might not like. Um, and so he's like, let's just keep it the way it is and I don't have to take those votes is my, and since, same thing Kirsten Cinema from Arizona, you know, uh, somewhat conservative um, jurisdiction. And so her, she might be in a bind between her party and her voters. So it often has to do with getting elected again. Yeah. Re-elected. Yeah. And what I would hope, I mean, like if I could tag to them, what I'd say is, uh, you know, like work with your party to tone the bill down. You know, that's, that's your job is representing your constituents and like make the bill something that your constituents will like, but but do something, you know, get it, get these things passed, get the COVID relief passed, get the HR1 passed, um, even if it's has to be a little watered down for your more conservative voters so that you can get reelected, at least do something. Yeah. Michael asks, does having numerous splinter parties increase the danger of political instability and the need to constantly form new coalitions like in Israel? Yeah, so Israel is... Um, uh, an example of a really low threshold for proportional representation. For, so for many years, their threshold was 1%, meaning any party that got 1% of the vote could get into the legislature. Um, they not too long ago moved it up to 2.5%, but it's still very low amongst um, other proportional representation nations. Most nations have a, a threshold closer to 10%. And what you see is most other nations have fewer parties and a more stable system than Israel. So I would certainly recommend any, you know, state or you know national bill that we have um, a threshold closer to Germany or Norway and not um, to Israel. Um, and so those places, as you, you saw with New Zealand, it had sort of like, you know, these two sort of anchor parties and then a couple of smaller parties that play in the coalition world. But overall, it's, um, it's, uh, it's fairly stable. It's not as fractured as Israel. Next question is, with so many voting rights suppression bills being uh, presented by Republicans in many states, what efforts are being made nationally to explain that this is misinformation or counterproductive to what we have in place now? Yeah, so I mean, there are, you know, like I said, over 100 voter suppression bills, but there's actually over 300 voting rights bills um, doing the opposite, you know, trying to introduce it. Um, automatic voter registration trying to improve vote by mail. Um, so, you know, th there is a little bit of back and forth, but actually just numerically, there's more people fighting for voting rights. And in terms of the, the narrative, um, I find this to be really interesting. So, so like Georgia is such a interesting place right now. And um, that some of the kind of more moderate conservatives there are feeling this pressure because so many of their voters are so convinced that this election was fraudulent. And you think like if, you know, if you get in the mind of that voter, if you believe that this election was fraudulent, that like that we've elected people who are now in charge of our country who, who were not supposed to be there, who were put there by bots or whatever, you know, you'd be outraged. And so these moderate conservatives have these constituents who are really Really convinced that they're that everything is fraudulent and so they're trying to figure out how to respond to, to sort of um, um, reassure those voters that elections have integrity and that they're doing something to improve the integrity of elections and I'd like to think that there are some moderate conservatives who are who actually you know care about uh, integrity of elections and not just about voter suppression I mean Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is a good uh, example. He really cared about running a good election and he pushed back um, on um, Republican pressure on him. Um, so they're trying to figure out what they can do to sort of reassure voters about integrity. And um, right now there's a Republican state legislative committee that's trying to gather together best practices. And I'm hoping that that legislative Republican Legislative Committee is listening to Republican Secretaries of State from Washington, Kim Wyden, and from Oregon, Bev Clarno, who um, I'd imagine are telling them, hey, vote by mail works, automatic voter registration works, being a member of the Electronic Registration Information Center works, and all of those things, um, if you do them right, 
they make your voter rolls clean, they make your elections more secure. And, um, you know, you, you, you can go out and message to your Republican voters about what really makes elections secure, um, instead of letting them hear all of this, uh, you know, bullshit, um, that's not really true. So I'm hoping that there are some Republicans who are doing that good messaging to their voters. Yeah, doing the right thing. Um, also, I want to mention we're having a democracy lobby week next week with the League of Women Voters, and we're going to be talking about a lot of these topics in depth as well. But we're going to be covering ranked choice voting. We have a session with some national leaders on HR1 for the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, as, as well as voting rights restoration for people uh, previously incarcerated to get their voting rights back immediately. Um, those are some bills that we're working on as well as a few others. So check out our schedule on that. Uh, we have time for another question or two um, from Jean. Does, doesn't proportional representation have almost the opposite effects of breaking into districts? Opposite effects of breaking into districts. So um, she's, talking, uh, she's talking about the single member district. Yeah, yeah. So, so proportional representation, like I said, there's many ways of getting there, but um, they all require some kind of multi winner district, which means, you know, if you're to keep your Congress the same size, it means combining districts. So there is a proportional representation bill um, in Congress right now. It's called the Fair Representation Act. And what it does is elect Congress members from districts um, of three to five members. So, I mean, so obviously there's a dozen states that have fewer than three members and they just have to elect statewide. But for the states that have three to five members of Congress who right now are split up into three to five districts within that state, they would all become a single statewide district with a ranked ballot to elect you know, you'd, you'd get to rank your um, your candidates and three that the top three winners or the top four winners, depending on how big your state is from the state would go on. So, yes, it would basically get rid of districts in those states that have five or fewer congressional uh, representatives. And in those that have six or more, it would break them into, you know, if you have six, it would break up into two, three winner districts. That's why it would be impossible to gerrymander them because of the way that set up is. Yep. Um, we have time for one last question and Amanda's question is, is great. What do you think is the single most important thing each person on this call could actually do to advance the solutions outlined in your book? Excellent question, Amanda, and a great one to end with. <laughs> It's a great question. Get involved with a group like um, Fair Vote Washington or Fixed Democracies First or Indivisible or League of Women Voters. All of those groups are already working on passing bills. You know, you've heard um, just right here in Washington, there's a local options bill to let, give cities the option to rank ballots. There's the um, reenfranchisement bill to, to restore rights. Um, each of those groups is already doing things, they're already talking to their legislators. And if you get involved, that gives them that much more power to get these things done. Well, that's a great way to end. And I just want to thank you, Kristen, for being here again and providing such wonderful information. Um, go out and get her book if you don't already have it. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone.